Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. Now your community have been asking me to talk about the Top 10's channel's video, the 10 horrible facts you didn't know about Samurai. So, let's begin. Okay, I'd like to begin by saying that I don't have anything against Simon as a presenter. What I take issue with are the 10 facts uh, that they talk about, and because of the way they talk about them, aren't facts at all. No, really, let me clarify this. Differently from the video 10 Terrible Facts About the Night by Mind Warehouse Studio, which was complete utter nonsense, this video has some historically accurate basis, meaning that some of the information that they give is actually true. However, these information are so distorted, thoroughly distorted and put out of context that they can basically make you see whatever they want you to see. So, I am going to debunk each single point one by one, but just to give you an overall idea, what's going on here is that they have nitpicked the most nefarious, heinous, underhanded and amoral things done by some samurai, a very small amount of samurai, in very specific times within Japanese history and in sometimes in very even specific, in, in even very specific places and made it look as if all samurai did them everywhere in Japan and within the entirety of samurai history, perhaps exception being just one point where they do specify when it happened. Now, why have they done that, would you say? Well, it's quite obvious because people are attracted to these really, really incredible things. And of course, this brings in a lot of views, but it also spreads out misinformation. This is where my channel comes into place. So let's get it done. They tested swords by cutting people in half. In a nutshell, testing a sword involved testing the sharpness and quality of a blade on a straw mat. Sometimes, though, when the client purchasing the sword was particularly wealthy or of high enough social standing, the sword would be tested on a live, often screaming, condemned criminal. Okay, the problem here is that it's true that the samurai did test their blades on convicted criminals, but First of all, differently from how, what the video says, most of the times they did it, and as far as I know actually, all the times, they first beheaded the victim, the criminal, and then they would proceed on to cutting the rest of the body to test the blades. I'm not saying that this is a nice thing, but let's look at it for what it really is. Capital punishment. This is what it is. And it's very hypocritical to point the finger to a specific culture and a specific warrior caste because they were having capital punishment when we still have it now in 2016 and there are plenty of supporters of that. And the method itself, I mean, okay, beheading is not nice, but lethal injection, electric chair, they are horrible as well. I mean, have you ever read an article to see what these methods actually do to the convict and how they actually die? So the real question here would be, are you a supporter of capital punishment for certain criminals or are you not? This is the thing, but it has nothing to do with Japan, Japanese or Samurai. Samurai randomly murdered people for fun. During the tumultuous Sengoku period of Japanese history, there was an informal practice among Samurai known as Chushugiri, which roughly translates to crossroads killing. Invariably undertaken by Samurai who'd recently purchased a new weapon or mastered a new technique for turning someone's bowels inside out, the practice involved walking around at night testing the new weapon or technique on the first person they found. In the rare event that a samurai was caught cutting down an innocent civilian, they could always claim they were invoking their right to. Tsujigiri is a crime which happened in a very specific period, the Sengoku period, 1467 to 1600. The reason why this crime happened, and again, it was brought to pass by a very small number of samurai, and if we see the actual numbers of these um, events, we are talking about criminals. Like, yeah, they might have been samurai, they were just psychopaths, just like you could have psychopaths in any country and doing whatever job. Of course, a samurai psychopath is more dangerous than a peasant psychopath because of his access to training and weapons. Now, this happened in the Sengoku period because we are talking about a widespread anarchy. But when the order was restored, the Edo government prohibited this practice with an actual law in 1602, and all offenders would receive capital punishment. We should not imagine all samurai doing this between 15th and 17th century. That's not the case. I would just say this, there are good teachers, bad teachers. There are good cops, bad cops. The samurai were not taught to do this. Number eight, they murdered people they thought insulted them. Kirisut Goman was a basic right afforded to samurai that allowed them to immediately kill anyone of a lower class, including other samurai, if they felt insulted, with a punishing sword-assisted backhand. The only conditions were that one, they had to do so immediately after the perceived insult occurred, and two, there had to be a witness. Luckily, a samurai could use his own servant as a witness, meaning it was possible for a samurai to basically kill anyone he felt like without reprieve. Kiriste go man, kiriste go man. 
Okay, I'm going to read their own source here, which is in their description below the video. Because the thing is that, again, they are just taking a part of the truth and present it to you to just make the samurai look bad. But they're not reading the rest of the article, which I will for you now. So they read the first part all the way up to the fact that he needs to bring up a, a witness, but they don't read this. Punishment for the incorrect exercise of this right was severe. For example, an offender could be beheaded without being allowed to commit seppuku and have his house abolished, meaning that one of his sons could not succeed the title. Wrongful execution of commoners from different fiefs were also seen as an offence against the feudal state. So, using Kiriste Gomen as a pretext for testing one's sword was not as easy as it seems. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that Kiriste Gomen, again, it's a very specific thing to the Japanese culture because of the importance that they gave to the caste of samurai, the bushi. But if you didn't insult them in a really, really bad way, or you didn't do anything really bad to them, then no samurai would risk going through all that, like losing his house, losing his honor, uh, having his children punished for it just for fun unless he was a psychopath, in which case he would have probably been arrested anyways. And again, put it into context, what would happen if a common person were to insult a knight in the Middle Ages here in Europe? I think you see the point. Number seven, common women had to pay to marry them. It's noted that one of the most valuable traits in samurai wives was obedience, and that they were basically expected to do everything for their husband, including making themselves available for sex 24-7. Again, this has been talked completely out of context. You need to consider samurai as if they were knights. So it's talking about nobility, basically. Not strictly nobles in the sense of Japanese nobility or kizoku, but you should consider them very similar to the knights in Europe. A nobleman in Europe would not marry a common woman in most cases. Of course, it's not nice for women, but then we are going into a completely different thing. We are talking about the rights of women. And again, 500 years ago, we talk about rights of women. I think it was pretty much the same throughout the entire world. Again, it's not the typical thing only to Japan, the fact that women were not treated righteously. Number six, wives were expected to kill themselves if their husband messed up. Seppuku for the lucky few of you who've managed to make it this far on the internet without running into those people who are oddly obsessed with Japan was a form of ritual suicide practiced by samurai when they really messed up. Usually, it was done as a way to rob an enemy of the satisfaction of killing them. To commit seppuku, a samurai would slice open his own stomach with a small blade before his head was ceremoniously cut off by a trusted associate. But here's where things get, well, weird. You see, when a samurai screwed up so badly that he felt he needed to commit seppuku to die with at least a shred of honor intact, his wife was expected to kill herself too. Seppuku or harakiri can be difficult to understand from a Western perspective. It's a very Japanese thing, although there was something similar also in ancient China. So it's very oriental. I don't have really a lot of time to go into this, but there is one thing that they say in the film The Last Samurai that I really like and I would like to share with you. I've seen what you do to your enemies. The warriors in your country do not kill? They don't cut the heads off defeated kneeling men. General Hasegawa asked me to help him end his life. A samurai cannot stand the shame of defeat. I was honored to cut off his head. Many of our customs seem strange to you, and the same is true of yours. For example, not to introduce yourself is considered extremely rude, even among enemies. Understanding a foreign culture also means not to criticize them and point the finger, but try to understand their point of view on things. Now, I think I will make a, a whole video dedicated to seppuku and, and explaining this practice, but one thing that I'd like to say, it was not 
It was not a way to rob an enemy of the satisfaction of killing you. Absolutely not. It was a way to preserve honor. And again, they have a very different concept, concept of honor in Japan, which would need to be explained. And I don't really have time to do this now. The fact that the woman would kill herself together with a samurai, it was a way to be loyal to your husband. And it might be difficult for us to understand, but we are still not putting this into context. What was the rest of the planet doing at this time? We're talking about a period of murder, killing, conquest, raping, and put within the construct. I'm not really justifying this, but again, as an Orientalist, I'd like to say that just pointing the finger when we hear something completely out of context is not the way to understand. It's just being judgmental. So I will cover this point again more in details on a dedicated video. Number five, Bushido and how it killed thousands during World War II. Bushido is generally described as being a strict code followed by samurai that stressed the importance of honor and self-sacrifice. In reality, though, Bushido was more of a nebulous group of rules that samurai kind of followed when they felt like it. This didn't stop the Japanese government reviving the idea of Bushido during World War II as a way of convincing conscripts to die in the most explodey, screw you way possible. Yeah, I'll crash a plane into a battleship if it's what a samurai would have done. Now here, I don't understand why they talk about World War II. It has nothing to do with the samurai, the, the way that the government has used this co honor code to motivate people again has nothing to do with, with the very fact of, of how the samurai lived or did not live this code, depending again on the person. I do agree that the Japanese did some really bad things during World War II, particularly when they attacked Pearl Harbor without a, de a declaration of war, that it was something really bad, but we all did terrible things. We Italians did, Americans sent the atom bombs, Germans did what they did. It was war and people do awful things during war. And personally, again, I think you're pointing the finger here with almost with racism, because if, you, if we had said that, for example, English, French and Italians used the chivalry code to increase the morale of their troops, you would have probably thought it was cool. Number four, they used to shoot dogs with arrows for sport. Though samurai are synonymous with the katana, samurai placed a great deal of emphasis in learning how to properly use a bow, so much so that they trained by chasing dogs on horseback and shooting them with arrows. Over time, the exercise became popular enough that samurai and Japanese nobles began doing it for fun, competing against one another to see who could preemptively annoy Peter the most. Just so this entry isn't totally depressing, we should mention that the arrows used were sometimes padded so that the dog wasn't killed, but this was less out of concern for the dog's well-being, and more so that the samurai shooting at them didn't have to go out and buy more if they were really good at it. Right, the one about chase, practicing archery skills on animals, because again, I'd like to sp underline here that all animals have a right to live. The fact that we place emphasis on, on dogs is because of our culture. Within our culture, dogs are pets. Like honestly, a fox is very nice and cute. English people did fox hunts, nobody seems to care. We just point the finger at people who are different from us. But for example, look at the Indians. They could point the finger to us because we kill cows that for them are Sacred. Only a country that does not kill animals at all, as a whole, could point the finger to other countries. Like, if we didn't touch any animal, then we could say, this is awful, because you're killing animals. But we do. We kill lots of animals. Let, shall we talk about lambs, which are actually super young, and we kill them for religious reasons? And don't get me wrong, I love dogs. I prefer cats, but I love dogs. But what I'm trying to say, we are in nowhere the position to point the finger to them, because they kill dogs, because we kill lots of other animals which deserve to live just as much as dogs do. On the matter of padded arrows, here it says that the reason why they did it was so that they wouldn't have to go buy other dogs. That is not true. The reason why they stopped killing dogs it was because of pressure from Buddhist monks, which actually convinced samurai that it wasn't a good thing for their karma to kill all these dogs because of all the whole reincarnation and everything. And so they actually did. They convinced them and they stopped killing them. But again, then again, here they're just trying to ridicule them and make them look as bad as possible without giving the actual facts. Number three, they used to have lots of sex with teenage boys. It may surprise you to learn that becoming a samurai involved having a surprising amount of sex with an old creepy man. To explain, samurai training young boys in the ways of combat were allowed to take their apprentice as a lover until they became an adult as part of a brotherhood contract. Though it's noted that the samurai could only do this with the boy's express permission, anyone with a basic understanding of how consent works should be able to see how gross this is. 
Right, now this is true, and it did happen. Again, we can't really say it happened all the time, but it did happen. Um, so it did happen actually in ancient Greece, just to say. What really baffles me is that they underline teenage boys. Although it did happen sometimes, I have to say, and I myself uh, am strongly against sexual intercourse with minors, but it did also happen to adults. So what I fear here is all they are trying to do here is that they are ridiculing people for their sexual choice. Now, in this case, homosexuality. So again, apart from the teenagers, they're ridiculing homosexuality. Really? In 2016, are we still doing this? Number two, they refused to reintegrate into society because they felt they were above working. The idea of ronin, masterless samurai who become wandering swords for hire, has become almost as romanticized as the idea of the samurai itself, and as such, we felt like we should call them out for being awful people too. In short, if a samurai lost his master or otherwise dishonored himself, he'd become a ronin, which was roughly analogous with being a hobo. Despite being considered one of the lowest rungs of society, ronin still mostly acted like samurai, in that they treated everyone like crap and refused to work like normal people, considering it to be beneath them. They call out ronin to be awful people. Why such a generalization? Some ronin were bad, some ronin were good people. The whole concept of the ronin, I think I read in one of the comments, and I totally agree, very similar to mercenaries in Europe. You can't just stereotype the whole category and say, whenever they became a ronin, they would become criminals, killing people and looking everyone down. The primary function of a samurai was to protect people. Some samurai didn't and exploited the, those, the rights they had. But that was the basic thing. Number one, the kabukimono. Like Ronin, kabukimono were often masterless samurai who decided that being alive was a preferable alternative to letting someone cut their head off with a big sword. Unlike Ronin, though, they celebrated their new lease on life by being utterly fabulous. The kabukimono would dress in wildly flamboyant outfits in the most garish colors possible. Kabukimono, as samurai with no masters and thus no responsibilities, spends most of their time actively making the world a worse place. Very similar to criminal organizations, basically a, a sort of primitive mafia. This is what kabukimono wear. Needs to look at it not as something really linked to samurai, but something that generated in it on its own. It was a criminal society, a criminal organization like we have had in many many other countries and in many, many other cultures and times. Kabukimono have nothing to do with samurai. Alright then, well I hope that you enjoyed this video and thank you very much for watching. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Also, if there are other videos that you find a little strange or fishy and the information thereof is, is contrary to what you have studied at school or university, please let me know and I will have a look and if I find enough material for a debunking video to be made, I will. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.